Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end. Please wait for the handheld microphones because there is a tape recording, a film recording of the whole event. Um, there's a, this is a highlight seminar from the Amager Center. The next one will be on April 25th. James Liao from UCLA, who will talk on synthetic biology. And after this seminar, <coughs> we will have a reception in the lobby. It's my pleasure to introduce David Keith, whom I've known for something like 20 years. Um, and I've been spending some of the day with him. And I realized that what he's doing and trying to do and trying to get others interested in doing can be put in terms of, the, of a new kind of climate science. Climate science has primarily been in the same spirit as astronomy. You watch, you observe, and then you model. But you don't tickle. You don't change the system on purpose in physical terms. And David has been asking, well, what, if, what could you do if you, if you released yourself from that constraint? He's been invent inventing what I'm calling interventionist climate science. Deliberately insert particles in the stratosphere, for example. In the process of the hearing the conversation today, you affect not only reflectivity, but you create local heating, you affect ozone chemistry, you have effects on cirrus clouds, um, you might affect the hydrocycle and cyclones, and of course there'll be global cooling. So you have a whole way of asking new questions about the planet. They, they are typically called geoengineering, but they could as equally be called a new kind of climate science. David is passionate about moving this field forward, as you will hear today. For those of you who don't know David and, his, and this new field, I recommend a book by Oliver Morton out just a year now called The Planet We Made, How Geoengineering Could Change the World. David is a professor at Harvard. In the, he's the Gordon McKay Professor of Applied Physics, and he's the professor, joint appointment Professor of Public Policy. The first is at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Science, and the second at the Harvard Kennedy School. Please welcome David. Keith. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, get myself set up. So. I prepared a talk that's actually, I was originally had, a, had in my head, I was talking to an audience more at GFDL, so I've got lots of technical detail, but I'm gonna start and end with some really general things about this topic. And I'm, especially with this audience, I'm really happy to get questions or interventions that's dynamic that can work better. So let me start with some of my assumptions or biases, and you can figure out which, or maybe there's not even a sharp distinction. So the central one is that I think of this idea, solar geoengineering, um, as fundamentally about something that is a, a supplement, not a substitute to cutting emissions. So in the long run, if you want a stable climate, we have to stop putting CO2 in the air. I think you, it really is just period. It may or may not be true that it would be useful to do some variant of this thing, and what it is, in fact, is evolving quickly, I believe, as I'll show you, this thing that might further reduce the risks. Um, but, but if you do it, you do it as a supplement to cutting emissions. Some said that's a bias. Not everybody has to think that. I don't think you can prove that in the court of science, but I think it's the way I think about it, and I think it's the best way to think about it. Um, I think a lot about the idea that, that this should be done in a way that is moderate, in the sense that we don't use solar geoengineering as a way to, say, hold global surface temperatures constant, we don't use it uh, to do all the work that needs to be done by cutting emissions, but we use it uh, to reduce rates of change, um, and we do it temporarily, and we do it in a way that's responsive. I think it's also important to say that it's a supplement, but it's a supplement that enables some outcomes that you can't achieve or can't achieve with certainty by cutting emissions. So um, partly because of some of the feedbacks, especially carbon cycle feedbacks in the system, <laughs> We actually don't know for sure what happens if we cut emissions, even if we cut emissions to zero today. And uh, so the combination of emissions cuts and doing solar geoengineering may allow us to achieve with confidence 
things like, say, keeping under a temperature threshold of a degree and a half centigrade, for example, from pre-industrial. Whether or not that's good, or we, can, we can debate about. Uh, but I think it's a fact that it enables some outcomes you can't get to with emissions cuts alone. Um, it appears, and I'm happy to answer questions about it, maybe wrong, but it appears that it is so cheap that money isn't the issue. That it's a risk to risk choice. There are a whole series of risks of doing this thing, and again, what the thing is is evolving, and part of the point is to actually have a research program to find out more about it. But um, there are also risks, of course, of just having CO2 in the atmosphere, and the issue is which risk is larger, comparing the risk of having CO2 in the atmosphere with a little bit of solar geoengineering or not. Both are risky, both are uncertain. If you come here thinking I can uh, uh, ever tell you exactly what all the risks of solar geoengineering are, or if you think that we have to know what all the, the effects are before we do it, then you definitely uh, uh, would vote never to do it, because we, we, we certainly will not know all those things. This is a simple little schematic that gives you a, a look at this. So if this is a radio forcing, you know, how much humanity is pushing the climate system in some way related to how much the world warms up, some business as usual trajectory basically has radio forcing just going up. If we cut emissions to zero, what we do is basically stop the radio forcing going up. It will eventually come down, but very slowly on a kind of human time scale. Uh, we stop it getting worse by cutting emissions. If we had a way to gradually pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, we can, we can reverse ourselves and, and, and uh, make it go down. I won't talk about that any further. But um, uh, if you do solar radiation management or solar geoengineering as well, then you could um, uh, further reduce it. But the, the idea is that, to think about it as a combination. And this also illustrates the fact that the amount of solar geoengineering you do here would grow and then shrink. So it's something that's inherently temporary. It slows down the rate of change. So the last thing to say, which I think is the most important, is it's tempting to leap ahead to ask yourself, would we ever want to do this thing? And obviously, who's we? We is not mostly us in this room. It may be the people who are most affected by climate change. It may be people who are not born yet. The decision that I think we are making, actually some people in this room, is whether or not we have a serious research program. And I think it's important to, to disentangle what our research program does is it teaches us things. It may teach us that this really doesn't work very well or that it works better or there are ways to reduce the risks. The research program is about reducing our ignorance. These ideas, these ideas that are now called solar geoengineering, are in fact old. They've been around since the 1960s. They arrived in the first report on climate change that President Johnson got in 65, and they arrived again in the 70s in various reports and in the early 80s. So the ideas aren't new, and they can't be uninvented. So if you're somebody who thinks we should never, ever do this, fine. But whether or not you think that, you can't actually force the next generation never to do it. The next generation will make decisions about whether or not to use these technologies, even if we do or don't have a research program. The question is, do we want to give them more information with which to make more informed choices? That's, that's a, the decision we're making. And right now, just to lead to what I'll say at the end, uh, although there's research programs in China and the UK, although uh, the National Academy recommended research programs in its 1982 report, its 1993 report, and recently, we don't have a research program in the US. And, and it's interesting to think about whether or not that's a good idea and why. So I'm going to try and go through some things fast, some things slow. I've got a few little samplers where I'm just going to give you little tiny bits of stuff, kind of like one uh, a slide per scientific paper, little tidbits that some of you may go, some of them may be too fast to be useful. And then I'm going to dive deep into one topic. And that one topic is uh, new stuff we've been doing that shows ways that might, new work could be wrong, but might allow us to do solar geoengineering with uh, a, a no loss of ozone, in fact, by increasing the, the ozone. Uh, in the stratosphere, and with some other advantages, but with its own risks and uncertainties. Um, uh, but, but, so that's the main part, and I'll, I'll go through that pretty quick. But first, let me start with a, a really basic thing. A very common statement is the following. It actually occurred in this recent National Academy report, right at the beginning, and that statement is that doing solar geoengineering does nothing about carbon. And I think that statement isn't true. In fact, elsewhere in the Academy report, there were lots of references to papers which shows it's not true. And the fact that the report said that tells you something about the, the curious ways people are constructing the way they think about this problem. Um, uh, uh, to be clear, just, just to get this up, I mean, in the end, you have to cut emissions if you want, have to cut emissions zero if you want a stable climate. So nothing about solar geoengineering gets you out of the need to cut emissions, but it does reduce burden, or could reduce the carbon burden at the end of the century significantly in ways that matter. And the reason is this. 
There's lots of different graphs I could have pulled out, but there are carbon cycle feedback. So if we put a given amount of carbon in the atmosphere, whatever humanity it does for moving carbon from the geosphere to the, to the atmosphere over this century, the world will warm up. We don't know how much. There's different uh, climate sensitivities. We don't know how sensitive the climate is to CO2. And then the biosphere will respond, and the oceans will respond, and the, the net effect of that response is likely to put more carbon in the atmosphere. So this is a, a simulation that I think treats an important case. Andrew Weaver treated the case where you both stop CO2 emissions and you stop the sulfur associated with CO2 emissions, which itself is cooling the planet down. And this case is only relevant if you have a time machine because it was saying, let's say you stopped all emissions in 2013. And the result from that model, there's lots of uncertainty in these models, are that if the climate sensitivity is low, then CO2 concentrations gradually reduce uh, over the next 300 years. But with high, high CO2 sensitivity, uh, uh, climate sensitivity, you actually get more carbon and more warming over quite a few hundred years. It eventually would, would turn around. It's not a runaway, but, but you actually get a lot more warming. So you like, could easily lose the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, even if you stopped emissions today. So I think it's important to hammer that because it shows that this isn't a simple case of either or. And it's not as if that we just should do what we really ought to do and cut emissions, because the fact is cutting emissions doesn't guarantee us climate outcomes. This also illustrates the fact that if you uh, whatever you do for emissions, if you held temperatures more constant, it probably is true, but we haven't done much research, that's why we need a research program, that you would have less carbon in the air at the end of the century. Maybe significantly less. So here's estimates from a, a, what seems to me, I'm not an expert, to be a really serious hot, uh, review of, of, of per permafrost carbon, the question of how much carbon might get re re released from the permafrost um, uh, uh, over this century under a uh, uh, high or sort of business as usual emission scenario. And the answer is somewhere between maybe 50 and close to 200 gigatons carbon. Uh, uh, John Dune, I guess, who I met earlier, has convinced the numbers more at the, at the 50 end. And I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm just reporting uh, on this topic what other people say. Uh, but the bottom line is that it's pretty clear from a variety of these models that, that you would get some reduction in carbon. We're doing a very simple paper. This is a preliminary thing. We're just adding estimates from literature and quadrature. We're doing we're not going to be experts. This is not a review paper. It's just sort of pointing this out. We're estimating uh, uh, how much you would cut atmospheric burden in 2100 um, uh, uh, under an RCP 8.5 scenario if you held temperatures flat, which I don't think you should do anyway. So in some sense, we're deliberately producing a big outcome. But it's interesting. They're, these are pretty big numbers. And there are these energy sector numbers. So there's a whole bunch of papers that show that as the climate warms up, the energy sector actually uses a little more energy uh, for air conditioning, for example. And because power plants work less efficiently. And so that's not that much, but it's a few tens of gigatons. So there's some, there is some burden there. So I am not telling you that solar geoengineering is the solution to our carbon problem. It's not. But I am telling you that there are some interesting ways that people frame things, maybe even biases, that result in an academy committee of really thoughtful people writing that. So here are a few more tidbits. Uh, I've spent a lot of the last 10 years in different ways thinking about how, um, uh, uh, about the impact of putting aerosols in the stratosphere uh, and how well it would work to reduce climate risk. But of course, you also have to think about the direct risk. The fact is we kill more than a million people a year globally from, from uh, air pollution, from sulfates alone. And so you should ask yourself the hard question of what are the impacts of putting more sulfates in the stratosphere. I think one of the issues is sort of moral question that if we're really going to advocate for doing something like this, people will be injured, and you've got to start thinking seriously about how many people. So this is a collaboration between uh, with Steve Barrett, a professor at MIT Aero Astro, who's done a lot of work on atmospheric effects of aviation. He has a, for those of you in the kind of know the modeling world, he's got a very clever uh, uh, linear adjoint model for geos chem and a bunch of health impacts models, and they basically had all the right tools to allow us to calculate what the surface air quality impacts are of geoengineering. And the results were really not what we expected. Um, uh, and quite interesting. So we were mostly thinking about the fact that if you put this million tons a year in the stratosphere, or whatever it is, of sulfur, some will end up at the boundary there and, and cause health impacts. We thought we should work that out. And that, that's there. Um, it's this number right here. So it's this number of a few thousand people, which is not nothing, uh, who would be injured from PM 2.5. This is the particulate matter that causes problems from the sulfur coming down from the stratosphere. But it turns out there's all sorts of much bigger impacts that we really didn't think about very carefully before we started this. Um, and those impacts are mostly to do with the way we're actually reversing the climate change. So um, uh, uh, for example, when you cool the climate down, you turn out to get less tropospheric ozone for a variety of reasons. Principally, you're moving precursors around less. 
But when you cool it down, you actually uh, uh, change PM 2.5 because of uh, the lifetime of some nitrogen species, basically because of making ammonium nitrate, so it changes the aerosol mass. So we actually make things worse by cooling it down on PM 2.5. Um, and then there are a bunch of other, other uh, things that add up, including another fact I haven't thought about, that, that putting sulfur in the stratosphere reduces ozone, stratospheric ozone, and that can be bad because it increases UV on the surface, but it turns out a significant part of the ground level ozone in places like western US is stratospheric ozone that mixed down, and there's health implications of that. So in fact, it's not all bad to reduce stratospheric ozone. That was a surprising outcome of this. I'm not advocating for destroying the ozone layer, but this is what you do when you just try and work through all the health impacts. That's a tip. Um, now, I want to dive in and say more about the work we've been doing on thinking about ways to do stratospheric solar geoengineering with less impacts. The baseline idea, the idea that's been around forever, for decades, is going to put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere in the form of SO2, in a sense, mimicking volcanoes. And an important thing to say, I guess, is it's the devil we know. There's natural sulfur in the stratosphere, even when there aren't big volcanoes, there's natural processes that put it in the stratosphere. And uh, we've observed what big volcanoes do. Uh, Alan Roebuck in the audience here knows a huge amount about that. And, and so, so the advantage of doing sulfate aerosols is we're building on natural fluctuations, and there's some sense in which we're always going to be more confident about what the results are with sulfur than with any of these fancy new ideas I'm showing you. So while the fancy new ideas I'm about to show you potentially have less risk, they also in some way have more unknown unknowns because they're not sulfates. But, uh, but let, me, let, me, let me dive in. So first of all, there's some interesting feedback. So we know that uh, uh, sulfates in the stratosphere can destroy ozone. And the basic mechanism is chlorine that we put there from chlorofluorocarbons um, uh, adds to the halogen burden, adds to, the, to, to chlorine in the stratosphere. And the main way that chlorine works is when it's in the form of chlorine monoxide. That catalytically destroys ozone. But at any given time, Almost all, more than 95% of the chlorine in the stratosphere is not chlorine monoxide. It's in an inactive reservoir species like chlorine nitrate or HCl. And the, uh, what, what happens when you put sulfuric acid in is you shift the chlorine from that um, reservoir species back to the active uh, uh, kind that destroys ozone. That's the principal method by which uh, adding sulfates to the stratosphere damages the ozone layer. And this is just illustrating the fact that there's actually, that's not the only thing going on. So, of course, sulfates in the stratosphere are also reducing surface temperature. That's the reason we're putting them there. And that's going to change something about the tropical tropopause, which turns out to matter for getting water vapor in the stratosphere. And that will change water vapor in the stratosphere, which changes something about ozone. And so it turns out to be complicated to actually figure out what the ozone impacts are, although it's pretty clear that putting sulfates in does damage the ozone layer. This just at least gets some of the interesting topics on the table. Now, back for context for a second. Um, one way I at least think about solar geoengineering is to divide it into two buckets. One bucket are what I call the efficacy. So uh, you can think about this as uh, 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 anything you do, even the most perfect form of solar geoengineering, maybe by, by putting mirrors in space, perfect in the sense of being kind of perfect in engineering sense. It, it, it isn't anti-CO2. It can't reduce all the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And indeed, the, there's a scientific question of how much it can reduce a risk we actually care about. How much can it reduce, say, uh, loss of ice mass from glaciers that make the sea level rise? Or how much does it uh, reduce heat, heat, heat waves? We've, people are investigating all these topics, but these are all things about the efficacy, about how well it works or doesn't work, if you could have a relatively clean alteration of the solar constant, cleanly reflects a more uh, sunlight away. And then for any actual way you try and reflect away sunlight, there's going to be a whole host of side effects and risks that are dependent on the actual way you do it. So if you put sulfates in the stratosphere, you're going to have these impacts on the on, on on ozone, you're going to warm the lower stratosphere. Uh, I'll show you that in a second, and that has all sorts of other impacts you'd, you'd rather not have. You've got these health impacts that I just showed you some results of. You've got a bunch of ecosystem impacts. So all those things are specific to the way you do it. And so the rest of it, I'm going to talk about other ways to do it that might, might perhaps reduce some of these impacts, but none of them change the basic question of how well it works or doesn't work, which I won't go into much in this talk. Um, so, Let's go way back. This is a very physics-y, strange paper by Ed Teller of Bomb Building fame that, that produced a whole bunch of, of ideas for advanced uh, scatterers that might be more, really they focused on more mass-efficient scatterers, ways to scatter more light with less total weight in the stratosphere, because they were really thinking about reducing cost, which, as I've argued to you, really isn't the issue. And one of the changes here is starting to stop thinking about reducing cost and start thinking about reducing risk. 
So then I published a paper that I think is very much in the same vein. This is a paper on little levitating particles. And in some ways, it was as silly as the Teller paper in that it, um, it, it didn't take account of any of the sort of realities of atmospheric chemistry and the interaction of particles. Um, and people began to look a little bit. There's been a bunch of uh, papers looking at, say, titania particles in the stratosphere. But those also were very odd in some ways. Those papers, it turns out, as I'll show you in a minute, didn't use the right optical properties for the titania. And they didn't take account of some of the key feedbacks. So here's an old paper we wrote that looked at, at some of the important feedbacks of, of the, uh, what happens when you warm the tropical troposphere and how more water vapor in the stratosphere can be uh, problematic. So, so we began to think that we need to build a more serious model that could deal with these problems. And the problems that we want to deal with are the fact that, that if you have a, a solid aerosol in the stratosphere, it will interact both with itself, so two solid particles can stick together and coalesce. Then they form a fractal, and you've got to figure out how you account for that. There's lots of science to do that, but it hadn't been in a stratospheric model before. And, and they'll also interact with the background, the background natural sulfate aerosol. And so if a sulfate particle hits a solid particle, you get a coated sulfate, coated solid particle, and that matters. So we modified a model to put all this stuff in. It was a model that was a, a, a very good two-dimensional stratospheric chemistry model. And now we have, a, a, you know, for those of you in the business, we have a kind of full prognostic scheme for sectional scheme for solid aerosols, for liquid aerosols, and then for liquid coated solid aerosols. So I'm going to show you results from that. But actually, before I show you results from the model, we've got a little interlude. It's even more kind of narrowly techy that I'll try to go through fast on, on radiative transfer. And it just shows you one of these cases where the details matter in science. People have been casual, and once you actually start to do your homework, it, it turns out to matter. So we started to do our homework, uh, and this is John Dykema, most of all, working with me looking at just what are the op optical properties of these um, materials that people have happily, there's like 10 papers that have looked at the materials, but they haven't looked at the optical properties carefully. So for example, despite all this work on titania, there are two kinds of titania. And one kind, I always forget which, uh, the rutile kind, has this big absorption feature in the, in the blue side of the spectrum. It means that it's terrible, as you'll see in a minute. Um, uh, uh, so we, we actually went back and spent a lot of time going back to the original literature and trying to figure out what the optical properties of these materials are. Um, this gives you the first beginning of sort of circling back to atmospheric science. So this is, this is saying, using a really good radio transfer model, saying if we want to reflect away one watt per square meter of solar band light, and we want to do it with aerosols evenly mixed over some area, and then we do this, um, some fixed dynamical heating approximation, and then calculate how much we're heating the lower stratosphere. And so these are big numbers. So this is only a watt per square meter of cooling. And we're saying that if you, say, use this kind of titania that's a rutile, you heat up the lower stratosphere by a, a degree and a half, which is a lot. Um, this gives you a look at what's causing the heating, whether it's the long wave or short wave causing the heating. And so you can look at the fact sulfate also heats the lower stratosphere a lot, mostly from long wave absorption. The short wave isn't very important. Um, uh, and some of these other particles do very, very little heating. So we were kind of excited about that. And in particular, the reason calcite's there, you'll see in a minute. Calcite turns out to have another potential advantage, but it also is very good optically. And that's the kind of nice coincidence we've got. Um, uh, I will think it's enough, enough complexity there. So now I'm going to start showing you results of that two-dimensional atmospheric chemistry model with, that, that deals with, with materials. And now maybe this will appeal more to people as sort of engineers and economists. You don't necessarily have to understand all the atmospheric chemistry to, see, to think about trade-offs. So the way I think about trade-offs here, there's lots of dimensions. But I'm going to think about radiative forcing on the x-axis, how much you're cooling the planet, versus ozone loss. So ideally, you might like to have something that allows you to just manipulate one thing. You'd like to have an engineering way to make radiative forcing and not lose ozone. Um, or maybe make more ozone. We'll get there in a minute. So this is the standard scheme for adding sulfuric acid. It's slightly different if we add H2O. Or whatever, it doesn't matter. This is the standard SO2 system. Now, this depends on some assumptions about when you do it, because the ozone loss is mediated by chlorine, and we have maybe the most successful global environmental treaty of all time in Montreal Protocol, it's reducing the amount of chlorine. So if you do the same amount of watts per square meter later in time, this century, you'll get less ozone loss. And this model also has some short-lived species in that, that tend to exaggerate ozone loss. Actually, we think they're more correct, but we're biased higher than most other models for ozone loss. Um, so first of all, this is 80 nanometer alumina particles. So they're way too small to scatter efficiently, but they make lots of surface area. So they're basically great for destroying ozone and useless for, for cooling the climate. But it just you know, shows you the model is doing something interesting that we expect. Um, then we, we try different particles, including diamonds and so on. And the bottom line is we can uh, find these solid particles can have about half the ozone loss uh, uh, and other properties as well. So half the ozone loss 
and also um, much less diffuse light scattered down, which turns out to matter, and much less heating of the stratosphere. And so that's sort of where we were about a year ago. And then we began to think about whether the particles could be chemically active as well. And so the insight is that the thing that destroys ozone in the stratosphere are basically four acids. So the acids that destroy ozone are basically, first there's three acids that are linked to catalytic cycles. Nitric acid, HCl, and bromine, all linked to catalytic cycles, all of which are ozone destroyers. And then H2SO4, sulfuric acid, doesn't directly destroy ozone in that way, but it indirectly links through like this chlorine nitrate mechanism. So we thought, well, what if the particle you were putting in the stratosphere was a base? Like, like uh, calcium carbonate or something like that. So, so um, we began to experiment with that. Actually, we have literally experimented. I'll show you a lab experiment in a minute. And, and we began to build this into the model. And, and here's the results. Oh, here's the, oh, that's some of the new chemistry added to the model. There's a lot of interesting, actually, some interesting chemistry here that we, Frank Koich helped add that we hadn't thought about. So, so there's a question of acid substitution. So if you first react, say, with, with chlorine, or with nitric, what happens when it hits a sulfuric acid droplet? Does that drive out the nitric or not? So we've done what we think is the right thermodynamic answer, but whether it's the right kinetic answer, whether it's what really happens, I think we just don't know. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just, in the interest of time, skip to some of the key results. So, so um, this shows you the change in the catalytic cycles that are the central cycles that mediate the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. And this is with, we're hitting it pretty hard. We're doing the equivalent of two watts per square meter of forcing with calcite. And um, uh, that's five million tons or five and a half million tons of calcite a year in the stratosphere. And uh, the solid lines are the current stratosphere, which is already perturbed. Um, uh, it's got the chlorine in it, for example. And the dashed lines are, are um, when we do the calcite injection. And the big effect, basically, is we're removing a lot of nitric acid and the associated uh, uh, NOx from the lower stratosphere. And that really changes the chemistry in, in profound ways. I would say this is something that's this is a big perturbation that you would definitely not want to do casually. And, and the net result is we increase ozone significantly. We increase column ozone by quite a few percent and increase it at all seasons. Um, this, this shows you the trade-off. Oh, sorry, that's overprinted. That's the name of the paper that somehow has got up there. Um, so this is, we switched signs because different authors had different sign conventions about radio forcing. It's the same number as before. Um, so, so this is two watts per square meter of cooling radio forcing. And with the calcite, and there's various uh, uh, um, um, sensitivity tests up there. But with the calcite, we can increase ozone by a few percent at the same time as, as having a few watts per square meter radio forcing. So that's an example of a way that we might have to reduce the risk of solar geoengineering. Might because this is paper one and it might be wrong. For all sorts of reasons it might be wrong. I think what this really illustrates is that if there was a real research effort, new things would come up. So because there's sort of been a taboo and there hasn't been research really looking at this, nobody's done this very much. And, and I certainly am not claiming that we found a way to do this. I'm claiming that we found something interesting. And if there was more research, we'd find more. And we might find ways to tailor solar geoengineering to significantly reduce some of the risks. Uh, uh, but to do that, we need to think both about uh, doing better lab science and doing in situ experiments. And so I'll, I'll carry on and show you a little bit about experiments. This just gives you a sort of overview from a paper we wrote about a whole, whole set of experiments. But now I want to step back and show you three experiments that we are working on in our group. The first one is actually, let's get out of the physical science world, let's go to social science. So the first experiment is, um, relates to the question of whether people react to a potentially risk-reducing technology by um, a behavior that's sort of substitution or complementarity. So let me give you an example that's more, an uh, example that may be familiar in everyday life. So if I was your doctor, let's say I'll, I'll have Rob be the subject. I, I'm Rob's doctor, and Rob comes to me, and, and I've been recommending him for 20 years that he should really get more exercise and, and uh, eat healthier. And then, then I say, well, Rob, I'm going to prescribe you Lipitor. And it has this set of risks. There's a known set of risks that will hurt you. But it, on the net, it's going to be better for you. And then the question is, how does Rob react to this information? And one possibility is he, uh, uh, it's uh, um, a substitution effect, where he uh, says, OK, I'll take a Lipitor, but now I'll actually relax, and I'll, I'll drink more wine and, and, eat, and eat more bad foods and get less exercise, because now I've got the Lipitor to protect me. Or maybe what will happen is he'll actually be scared, and the heart risk will be more salient in his head, and he will be more likely to do the good things he was supposed to do anyway. And then he'll get a double benefit. 
I get the health benefit from Lipitor and the health benefit because of the higher salience of the risk that made him act differently. There's no right answer. I don't know how Rob will react, and Rob might react totally differently from Alan. This is, there's not a right answer. It's tempting to think that one of those was kind of a bad, immoral reaction, but this is just personal choice. There's not a right answer. And it's an objective question how people react. And the question of how one person reacts and collective reacts are not necessarily linked in a simple way. So I don't want to overinterpret this. But we're starting to play around with uh, experimental design. This is an experiment that we're doing on thousands of people, um, um, social science experiment that Richard Sackhauser and, and um, Josh Horton, myself, and, uh, and Gernot Wagner are doing. And um, the way we do it is the social science experiment. We basically first ask some very basic demographics, where you live, whatever. Then in one mode, we give them no information uh, about climate risk, just assuming they've heard whatever they've heard in the news. Another will tell them some more stuff about the idea that climate's risky. And then we give them three options about geoengineering, and I'll show you those options. Where they range from a kind of geoengineering solves everything option to geoengineering is terrible option. Uh, we give them little, little tip, tidbits of information. I'll show you what they look like. And then we ask them a version of, of how much they pay to cut climate. We basically say, if there was a binding referendum held in your neighborhood that would cut emissions but cause your electric bill to go up, how much would you, would you pay for the electric bill? So this is the, the uh, geoengineering is totally great. We should just do it answer from Super Freakonomics. You can just read the highlights, but it basically says, well, it's 10,000. It's, it's a much better approach, we conclude. They've already got the conclusion before any research. Uh, and it's a thousand times cheaper, so it'd be crazy not to do it. That's the, the kind of super freak economics view. Um, then I, my collaborators chose this before they talked to me. This seems self-serving. The middle ground view, everybody thinks I have the middle ground, is, is my view. Of course, lots of people don't think I have the middle ground, but that's, that, that, was, that was a quote that people chose. And then, then there's a, a Naomi Klein view, which is, is on the other side, which says that uh, 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 it may cause the Earth to go wild in ways we cannot imagine. I kind of like that in some ways. And, and, it's, uh, and crucial, it said that the whole idea here is that solar energy is a means to keep the fossil fuel frenzy going as long as possible. It means to you know, keep partying on and avoid actually dealing what we should do to cut emissions. So these are a range of viewpoints about solar geoengineering. And the question is, how will people respond? How will it affect their willingness to pay? And we don't have the results yet, the experiment. We're just, just getting it set up right now. But this is an example of the kind of experiments you could actually do. And if we had a larger scientific research program on solar geoengineering, it's an example of the social science experiments that could be done. Um, we're doing lab experiments, too. So, so this is uh, uh, Zhen uh, Dai, uh, is a, a, a PhD student of mine and also works with Frank Koich. And we're doing a very classic version of, of uh, atmospheric chemistry experiment to measure what people call rate constants. So in all that fancy model I showed you that produced the increased ozone, it's great. I mean, first of all, there might be bugs in the model. But second of all, even if the model's right, the model depends on some reaction rate constants that, that we don't know. So there actually are some information. It turns out we found some papers on uh, actually acid reactions with calcite in the atmosphere, because there's natural calcite from rock weathering that's in the atmosphere and actually can affect atmospheric chemistry. So we, we, there's not no information, but there's not much. So um, what we're doing is building a pretty classic uh, flow tube reactor that will allow us to measure, say, uh, chlorine nitrate under stratospheric conditions reacting with calcite or aluminum or what have you. And, uh, and we can put UV on it as well, because uh, Frank is worried about UV aging in the stratosphere and how that changes surfaces. And so we're starting a lab experiment anyway. And it's probably one of the first experiments in the world that is actually intended to deal with how you might improve solar geoengineering, um, although it's a sort of small thing. Um, and then we've been doing a lot of work designing an in situ experiment. We're not doing this experiment. We, we think it might make sense to do it, or it might make sense to go down the next phase. These experiments are always phased, both in terms of how people develop them, how people refine the science, how people understand the risk of the experiments. But I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's called the Stratospheric Controlled Perturbation Experiment, or SCOPEX. And um, you know, we've, we've spent now you know, sort of a person year, a couple person year, a couple hundred thousand dollars thinking in some detail about experimental design. But it's still, in some sense, pretty half-baked. Um, the, the basic idea here is that we want to, to, to manipulate in a controlled way a small volume of stratospheric air and watch what happens. And so it's really a new thing. It's the idea that we can do controlled experiments of stratosphere. We're not trying to change the whole climate. The amount uh, the, uh, of material, actually water vapor is relevant here, or, or sulfates, um, less than, actually now we're, that's an old slide. Less than 100 grams of sulfates, we think we have enough signal to noise to see really good response. So that's the amount that is emitted by one minute's flight of a commercial aircraft flying, say, to Europe. So it's not, that itself is not the problem. 
the, 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 the use of balloon is interesting. Uh, our group uh, has done a lot of work flying high-altitude aircraft, the, the NASA ER2 or U2, and in those experiments, we've learned a great deal about stratospheric chemistry, including the sort of cause of the ozone hole, and that's basically by exploiting natural variability. So we fly a long trajectory in aircraft, and we watch one thing vary against another. Temperature vary against chlorine nitrate, and, and in our language, we think about partial derivatives to pick apart what's happening in natural variability. So we first thought about aircraft, but of course, in this thing, what we want is, is, is to deliberately perturb something and then measure it over time. Most stratospheric chemistry resets itself every day because these radicals are created by sunlight in the dark that go away. So if you do even a two or three days observations, you know a lot of the key chemistry in that local area. So the idea is how to make a volume that's perturbed and evenly mixed, and then how to observe it. And we've come up with a design that is a a super pressure balloon that maintains altitude, um, uh, and then it has a propeller that drives it very slowly, at, at literally walking speed, meter a second kind of speed. And the propeller serves two functions. It allows us to maneuver around the per perturbed area, but actually, we didn't think about this in the beginning. The propeller is crucial in making some mixed air into which we can introduce a perturbation, say, water vapor or, or calcite particles or what have you, because you need something well mixed and then you can fly back and forth through it over a couple days. So this is an evolving idea. Uh, uh, lots about this already is changing. We're gonna go back this summer and think harder about how to do a, a, a simpler experiment than this. But this is an example of one of the kinds of experiments that you could do that would not answer all questions about solar geoengineering, that obviously can't be done, but would reduce some of the uncertainties about, say, how stratospheric chemistry would, would uh, respond to putting sulfates in or putting calcite or one of these other things in. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll uh, a few more tidbits, and then I want to get a, more of a conversation going about um, whether we should have a search program and why we do or we don't. Um, just one tidbit is people have pretty much assumed that you just put sulfates in one place and we haven't adjusted very much. And so we began to think now, this is some early work, and there's later work now that um, uh, uh, Ben Kravitz, Doug Martin, a few others are doing. We really can look at how you could uh, uh, use feedback to adjust the effect. And the, the key idea here, I think, is that um, this is not an open loop thing. We don't have to model exactly what the impacts of one million tons a year of sulfates are. We have to figure out how we would use feedback to kind of close the loop and understand what would happen in an evolving system in the face of noise and uncertainty. And so in various ways, we're playing with that. We've actually done things like we've um, uh, 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 deliberately built a feedback loop around the climate model and tuned it up for one model and then used it on a different model to understand how, how having the wrong model uh, uh, changes things. And it's clear that th these feedback processes in some sense work. There's lots of work to do in understanding um, uh, uh, what the measurement noise is and what you're measuring and what the feedback parameters are. But this just gives you some look at it. One other uh, 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 paper that, that I was sort of excited about was gets at the question of one of the assumptions, there are various ways we might, humanity might use solar geoengineering. Obviously, one answer is not to use it at all. But um, one idea about how to use it is we use it primarily in the case of an emergency, or basically we use it if the climate sensitivity is very high. We use it if we find out that the climate is very reactive to CO2. And so an obvious question is, is since most of the work that's been done on understanding the climate response to solar geoengineering has been on models that have average climate sensitivity, the question is, is the sensitivity of models that have very high climate sensitivity systematically different? And so uh, there's no easy answer to that question at all, but we used uh, uh, something called a perturbed um, climate model ensemble, something called climateprediction.net, which has a, uh, a, essentially an ensemble of climate models that have slightly different physics that have a range of climate sensitivities, and we ran hundreds of different versions of this geoengineering experiment, and then asked ourselves, um, is the response different in an interesting way in the high sensitivity models from the low sensitivity models? And the answer is no, it's really proportional. That doesn't prove that's true, but it was true in the first time we looked at it um, uh, in, in, in a collaboration on that. Um, so now I want to pause and, and turn a little bit to think about um, why, why we should have a research program. And, and first I want to maybe focus on what I think are the two most serious reasons to to at least think hard about doing solar geoengineering. So one is the sheer impact of surface temperature. So there's been a, a great deal of um, econometric work, social science, trying to understand how just increase in temperature affect people. And the work is pretty stunning. It may actually be that it, 
that the direct temperature effect of climate change is as big as all the other effects combined in economic terms. And um, these are also very regressive effects. They hit poor people the most. And this is not just true in distant lands, but it's true in New York City. So um, uh, it's some really beautiful work. One of my colleagues has been looking at New York City schools and the test performance of students uh, as a function of hot days. And students at the very best schools, like Stuyvesant, they're such uh, tools, and they're so tuned up, and their school air conditioning doesn't fail, that you basically don't see their test scores vary at all um, uh, with temperature. But over the whole New York City school system, you see pretty big effects. And it's interesting because in economic terms, they're sort of wealth effects. Because if, if you believe that education is useful and gives people higher income over their lives, and there's some, there's some essentially wealth you built up from education, uh, it turns out that the business of, of reducing people's test scores and and number of uh, school attendance days also, uh, uh, it's pretty profound. Uh, you can also go back to, there's lab data, there's lots of US Air Force data showing people's um, um, uh, ability to do cognitive tasks as a function of wet bulb temperature, and it, it falls off pretty quickly. So, so people really don't learn as well and function as well when it gets hot. And of course, lots of the world doesn't have air conditioning. So, so I think there is, I'd say, increasingly strong evidence that extreme temperatures are are, are in fact one of the most basic and important impacts of climate change. That's not to say it's the only one, but I think sometimes we've lost sight of that. We've been talking about all the things that aren't temperature, and in fact, temperature is a big one. And it's one of the things we're most sure solar geoengineering can deal with. And so to me, that's one of the reasons to take solar geoengineering seriously. Because there actually are people living now, who will live over the next half century, whose lives will be impacted by warming substantially, and if there is a way that we could significantly reduce the risk for them, and it looks like there is, we should at least do the research in a serious way. So that, that's, that's one of my sort of strongest cases for thinking about it. The other one is, 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 is sea level rise. And, and yeah. uh, that's a glacier uh, up in the Quadacha wilderness, actually uh, uh, on my honeymoon. My wife and I spent two weeks in big, big wilderness, and we were up on top of a glacier for a lot of that time, and that's just a crevasse. Yeah. Um, uh, big enough to jump, like we jumped over one end of it. It's not that big. Um, 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 and, but those mountain glaciers are going pretty fast. Actually, I found out about that glacier because uh, I, I went with Sean Marshall, an ice sheet scientist, once to remove a bunch of his equipment from it. Uh, and, and, and those glaciers will go pretty quickly. Um, um, so, oops, going the wrong direction. So some of you may, may know about this paper that was published last week. Uh, 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 Pollard and, no. Conto. Conto, yes, thank you. Um, um, and, and it was one of the really interesting papers, one of the first papers that, that in a pretty credible model seems to show uh, that the West Antarctic ice sheet can really contribute a lot to sea level rise. But there's several details there. I mean, there's lots of neat things they did, like, 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 like you know, using an ensemble and constraining it to two different historical periods. Um, but, but you may have missed one thing. And that is that the mechanism by which this model destabilizes the West Antarctic ice sheet is principally the new mechanism is surface melting, uh, 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 which which breaks up the the, um, the I'm tired of using my words breaks up the floating ice shells that then allows the deglaciation. And so there's been it's very unclear I'd say how much solar geoengineering does or doesn't help reduce sea level. There's an interesting paper uh, um, uh, by uh, uh, Cecilia Bits and, um, and um, collaborators at, at University of Washington, I'm getting tired of losing names, uh, and they found in their model that, that Solar Geo didn't do much for West Antarctica, and the reason is they used a model that assumed, which most people have assumed, that the main impact on West Antarctica was sea surface temperatures, or sea temperatures, and, and they used sulfates in the stratosphere, which changed the vertical heating in the stratosphere, which changed the location of the southern winds a bit, and so it actually didn't help, and that may be true. And also maybe something where, where, say, the calcite or something wasn't sulfates that didn't heat the structure would be better, or not. You need a research program to find out. But an interesting thing about this paper is that it, it, it's the first paper that correctly reproduces uh, two of the different, uh, uh, both the last, uh, the last spatial maxima and the period about three million years ago, correctly reproduces the, the ice mass loss. And it depends on having surface melting. And surface melting is something almost certainly that could be affected by solar geoengineering uh, quite a lot. Um, so, so I think those are, the, those are the reasons to think that solar geoengineering might be something that could really significantly reduce risks, and that it might reduce risks that we can't reduce otherwise. So another 
another uh, feature of that recent paper on, on Waze is it shows that even if on the Western Antarctic, sorry, I use acronyms, is that even if we cut emissions very sharply, uh, uh, so that we bring emissions to zero just after 2050, you still have a significant probability that you deglaciate ways, and then it's hard to stop. And so that's where the combination of fast emission cuts and solar geo could probably give you more confidence that you wouldn't have deglaciation than just emissions cuts alone. Uh, so this is partly to get you out of the thinking that it's, it's either or, because I don't think it is. Um, so I'd like to get questions and comments on why we've chosen ignorance way, why we've chosen not to have a research program. Um, this, this picture, by the way, is one I took from a kayak in, in, in Antarctica. Um, um, and, and let me show you, before I start, one quote from the old National Academy. Of course, there's a recent Academy panel that says there should be a research program. But it's important to say the Academy said several times that we should look at this long ago. And yet, persistently, there's been a, a effective decision not to do it. And, and I want to get a, a, a view about why. Thanks. Eli Buzid, the Civil and Environmental Engineering. I actually had a couple of questions. Uh, two, two quickly relating to the science. How much of this uh, cooling effect is due to uh, reduced uh, water vapor in the atmosphere? If you keep the, atmos uh, I mean the atmosphere cooler, how much of it is due to the reduced greenhouse gas effect of water vapor? And uh, if, you, if you, let's say if you have a heat wave, and you were to deploy this uh, technology just uh, for the period of the heat wave, over the period of the heat wave, I mean, the direct impact is very small radiatively. Would you get any benefit out of that? Uh, and I had a quick policy question related to the fact that when we talk about geoengineering, there's two classes. One that is uh, iron, you know, iron in the ocean or, or sulfates in that uh, stratosphere that are take a while to stop and reverse, and the other class that is you know, cool roofs or, or, or direct carbon capture that uh, we can stop if we uh, think uh, things are not going the way we anticipated. And I wonder if you, you, uh, you're you going to try to see the different uh, perspective or responses of people to these different classes, whether you have control on the process or whether it can uh, you can lose control of it. That was a lot of questions. Yes. Um, uh, I think there's almost no connection between solar and carbon geoengineering. This is the question of which is better and which is worse. So they're part of the range of things we might do to reduce climate risk, from reducing our consumption of, of, of goods and services, to making things more efficient, to reducing ener making energy decarbonized, uh, uh, those things, and emissions mitigation uh, and adaptation. So there's a range of responses that we have. But I think that it's sort of an accident that they're both labeled geoengineering because, in fact, they're not, they're completely unrelated in the science and in the public policy in deep ways. That the whole structure of public policy problem of them is, is almost completely different. So, in a way, a sharp way to say it is I think there's almost no non trivial statement you can make that is true about both things that are called geoengineering and not true about other elements in climate. They're just not much to do about them, not, not, not ways in which they're meaningfully similar. So, I think in general, we make better policy by thinking about them separately. Obviously, they both connect in a long-run climate strategy, but, but obviously emissions mitigation, emissions cuts have to be in there too. Um, I, mean, I guess one other question you asked, I'll, I'll pick up on. There's one paper that looked at heat wave amelioration by Dave Nealon. I think it was completely unrealistic about how you actually put materials in and have them stay in one place for a short amount of time. The whole leverage that we have in the stratosphere is that materials stay there for a couple of years, uh, and, and so you can get this nice, even, global uh, a radio forcing with a relatively small amount of material. It's not absolute, it's a lot of material, but, 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 um, but it, the sense which is relative is, I mean, we're now putting about 50 million tons a year of sulfur in the lower atmosphere, that's what's killing people. And so we, we're talking here about putting a million tons a year or so in if you with sulfur, uh, if you do it efficiently. And so, so in that sense, it's relatively small. Whereas I think if you want to block a heat wave, you've got to put a, a much higher amount of radio forcing in one place, and this is in a moving atmosphere. So I had trouble thinking about how that could actually work. I basically don't take it seriously, but maybe I haven't thought about it enough. Um, those are two of your questions. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, so, so, so the climate response to, 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 I mean, maybe I'm not sure of the question. 
So the climate response involves all sorts of feedbacks. I said beetle <coughs> feedback, water vapor feedback, lobster feedback, blah, blah, blah. And, and the, the question is, are there interesting ways in which the climate feedback is different for CO2 compared to for uh, uh, adjusting the solar constant or aerosols, which is not quite the same as adjusting solar constant. And it clearly is different, but maybe not so different for lots of the lower atmosphere. I'd like a couple more questions. Uh, so I have a question. So uh, under what circumstances do you think we should not even test geoengineering methods? So um, the reason I'm asking this is, for example, the fission reactors are, if you do the math, more people die from coal then they do die from any sort of vision explosions and so forth. If you do a like, you know, yeah. mathematical analysis, it's all great. It's not even but close. people uh, you know, don't really uh, react in that way. And, and for example, like the Twin Towers, the majority of the people outside of the US think US did it to invade Iraq or whatever. And, and you know, when you do a, a test of this type, people will maybe make up things about the US is just going to change the climate and they don't want to reduce CO2 and so forth. So I'm just trying to see under what type of non-rational human reaction that you can consider that you would say, okay, it's just not worth even, even testing this because the, the feedback would be much worse. That, that's, a, that's a fair question. Let me, can I really have one hour advertisement? So I think um, uh, 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 Rob is right that Oliver's book is fantastic and it's better than my book, but my book at least is short. I <laughs> <laughs> your book, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I mean, Oliver's book is fantastic. It's really deep. Oliver's amazing. <coughs> uh, um, so, so to, to, to go at your question, um, first of all, let me give you a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think it's an important answer. It's not our job in the academy to solve all these problems. This is a democracy. It's our job, I think, mostly, to try and understand the science. And I think there's been a, a, a tendency in the geoengineering community to try and do the whole problem, to try and not only learn what the science is, but think through what the right public policy answer is. But this isn't a scientific priesthood. We don't make the decisions, and I don't think we should. Uh, I really believe the thing it says on the National Academy uh, I science statute that if you have the privilege to do what a lot of us do, sitting and getting paid to just research stuff that's interesting, you should just tell all you know. And ultimately, the questions of what we do here are not questions that some group of you know, people who happen to be atmospheric scientists should be deciding. So the question, this, 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 these hard questions about to what extent there's this substitution versus complementarity, that we shouldn't prejudge that and say we won't talk about solar geo or we'll make decisions about it based on our assumptions about that. That's sort of profoundly undemocratic. So that, 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 that's an important part of my view. Um, uh, I think we really can get carried away in trying to prejudge all those answers, and there really is a benefit to finding out more facts before we prejudge them. But, but I guess let me, let me sort of pick at what you said in a couple other ways, kind of going halfway to what you said, because I do think about it, of course, even though I said I shouldn't. Um, uh, one answer is I think it's really important these experiments be transparent and international as much as possible. Because I think there are dangers of kind of arms race-like configurations, and I think transparency and openness helps to reduce those, so it doesn't eliminate the possibility. Uh, I think that uh, it's tempting, especially in a powerful room of people in, in America, to think that America's the actor here. But we've recently actually had a, a student who's worked a lot in the developing world, spent a lot of time in the Philippines, interviewing people about solar geoengineering, including uh, uh, people who are acting in the policy process there. And it was really stunning. I mean, a lot of people said we'd really like to be involved. And actually, now they're talking about actually funding us to work. Uh, uh, so, so it, there's a tendency to think of the people who are the poor world that suffer the most as passive actors here, and they're not. And and I think it's actually unlikely the U.S. would be the lead implementer of, of these technologies. Um, but for experiments, I think um, I don't have a simple answer. I think the only thing we've thought about it doing our experiment is we would try and be as open as possible about it explaining why we're doing it and how it's funded and how the results are transmitted. Um, I, I think you're assuming implicitly your question one set of responses. I think that is one set we'll get, but you'll get other responses too. It's really unguessable. Okay, question here. Please identify yourself. Hi, Professor Keith. Um, I'm actually, I'm a freshman undergraduate student and I'm actually doing a research on your work and also other people's work on the topic of geoengineering for my writing seminar class. 
Um, and um, after reading your book and also Clive Hamilton's um, critics on geoengineering, um, I noticed that there's a main critic towards geoengineering that once it gains momentum um, in research, it will never um, stop, that it will just uh, go to deployment eventually, and it's really difficult to control that. So how would you address that issue? It's a great question. So I think you've got to think about why. So, so people think about these things as socio-technical feedbacks or lock-in. I think there are specific reasons where we think lock-in is more powerful and less. And, and you've got to separate out two different versions of uh, uh, it inevitably goes to it. I mean, one answer is that geoengineering actually provides a lot of benefits. And once you learn more, you find out about the benefits, and then you decide to do it. That's not a bad thing. But another reason that would be a bad thing is that um, some group of people uh, exaggerate the benefits um, understate the risks, and for their own self-interest, promote uh, it in a way that uh, uh, makes it happen uh, when, it, in a sense, it, it shouldn't. And um, the most obvious cases, the cases we're really familiar of, a big socio-technical lock-in, involve large amounts of money and hardware. And one interesting thing about this, of course, is it's so cheap, it's not clear that applies very much. So, or at least not directly. So you might be worried, and Naomi Klein worries a lot, and so does Clive Hamilton, with some justice, that there will be kind of a geoengineering industry, solar geoengineering industry. But it's important to think about that a little bit, because the cost is so small, and there's no business model, that it seems a very unlikely place to get kind of classic socio-technical lock-in in, in that narrow sense. Um, one way to think about it is, uh, I've worked a little bit with Dave Whalen. He was on uh, a high-level committee that I was on in this. He's a, a National Academy of Engineering member, and he's a top guy at Boeing, and I, this, I, I haven't talked with Dave about this, I'm just hypothesizing, but I imagine if Dave kind of said this should be a, a, a business for Boeing, I'm not saying he did this, I'm just sort of imagining, actually presenting this to the Boeing board, he'd say, well, if the biggest, this business is going to cost just the sheer lofting materials, a billion or two a year, and that, that, if we capture maybe 30% of that, that's like less than a billion that we make, that's actually tiny for Boeing. And what's the risk of this? Well, it could destroy our company because of liability risks. And what's the way to make profit? Not obvious. It's kind of a generic cost plus government operation, probably. Uh, uh, there's no obvious way you extract money from people for, for putting money materials in the air. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty weird business. Um, I think the larger topic that, that, that is more of a concern is that fossil fuel interests that would like to oppose mitigation will, will, will push geoengineering. And I think that is a concern. Uh, Maybe I should stop there. Yes, it's a concern, but on the other hand, no matter what, we have to deal with those interests as we cut emissions. It's not clear that this makes it that much worse. They're skittish, by the way. The oil and gas world, because they think they could get, they seem to be derailing action. You need your microphone. You can't do that. You're right. Who's saying that? Yeah. They, uh, go ahead, Barry. OK. Um, in a sense, we've been doing a geoengineering experiment uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the problem with it is that we've been putting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in reasonably large concentrations. Yep. And the damn stuff lasts for a very long time. It's got a, a very tenuous uh, half-life. Um, if you're going to do geoengineering of a more benign sort, it would seem to me that one of the things that needs to be emphasized, at yep. least, in the discussion is the lifetime of the thing that is going to cause yes. changes. Yes. Because if it's also going to stick up there for two or three hundred years and you've made a mistake, that's clearly going to be critically dangerous. Yes. Uh, so that's one of my comments. And the other one that worries me in, in, on, in, on the basis of many of the things you've said is that I don't see world politics, which can't even agree on climate change with carbon dioxide, uh, thinking sensibly and in a coherent manner uh, about what we really want with the geoengineering uh, tricks we're, we're going to try and play. If you're trying to grow peaches in Siberia, you might welcome global Canadians may feel a lot better off, but it's not going to be good for the guys in the Philippines. And whether that's just a question of what I call just global warming, which is what the mean temperature is, 
or whether it's a manipulation of the fluid mechanics of the atmosphere and the oceans, which seems to me to be another thing that one has to worry about when trying to decide on what to do. Uh, I, I just don't know how to separate those and how to get people to think coherently about them. We don't even know what the clouds are made of. I was reading an article before coming here that suggested we got the ratio of ice to water in the clouds wrong. And that had a significant change in the effect on global warming. So I'm sorry. I've yeah. done again. I've yeah. talked yeah. too much instead no, of... No, no, it was, it was, it, it, no. It wasn't too much. It was good comments and, and questions. So let me pick up the last one first, mm -hmm. which was, I think, about uncertainty. So part of your question, maybe I'm being unfair, was sort of was the, the question that said, we don't even understand clouds well enough. We don't understand the system well enough. And the answer is, of course, we don't understand the system as well as we'd like to. We can't predict very well how much it will change with CO2. There are big error bars. If we were sitting around the world 500 years ago and we had civilization that all ran on nuclear power or solar power, and we found cheap coal, we said, oh, maybe we should do this cheap coal and then geoengineer our way out of it, then your question would be really relevant. But we're not there. We have CO2 in the air. And we face this risk to risk choice. We don't know exactly how risky the CO2 in the air is. And we don't know exactly how risky it is to put sulfates in. The question that we have to ask ourselves, I don't think we know the answer to that either, but it's a different question, is which is more risky? Mm -hmm. Is it having two watts per square meter of CO2 and minus half a watt or one watt of sulfur in the stratosphere more or less risky than just having a two watts of CO2? And, and in many of the ways, those risks are correlated. So a bunch of those have to do with the large-scale climate response things that Isaac Held and people are experts on. And, and to the extent that they're correlated, then you can simply say having less radio forcing would be good. To the extent that they're not correlated or there's a new risk, then you can't say it. Exactly. Well, no, no, it is in this case. Yeah, remember, I'm talking about the uncertainty structure being correlated. That is, if you were uncertain about the CO2 impact, if there was only one knob and we, were, we didn't know the CO2 impact, and, but we, we, we are pretty sure that less CO2 impact would be good. And so if, if CO2 and radio forcing were the same thing, then even if you didn't know all the feedbacks, you'd be sure that you'd rather have less CO2, less radio forcing. Mm -hmm. It's not one knob. They really are different things, and so we can't be sure that solar geoengineering would be good, but it is not sufficient mm -hmm. to just say it's uncertain. Because the reductio ad absurdum of that is if it's so uncertain we can't do anything, then we would have no reason to cut CO2 emissions. The I reason to cut CO2 you. emissions is we know something about it. I want to ask a question of the group, because David asked toward the end, why, it was a rhetorical question, but it wasn't. No, I'd like to hear. Why yeah. aren't we proceeding with geoengineering research? Can someone either speaking on, the, on behalf of themselves, I, I don't think we should, and here's why, or speculating about the process, want to say something? And maybe, because I had a conversation with Denise Mauser, I'll let me clarify a little bit, but I'd really like to hear people's answers. So, yes, there are papers getting published. Uh, uh, um, there's... There has been and is small amounts of U.S. government funding, but there's no program. That is, there's no program that says, here's an organized research program, apply in. And a significant amount of the funding has actually been private philanthropic funding. So money's come to me that's funded people like Phil Rash and Ian Keller and others from Bill Gates. It's all public. It's philanthropic money. It's not for profit. But I don't think that's the right answer. Does uh, anybody I, want to take yeah. David's question up? Um, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Julio Herrera. I'm a grad student in environmental engineering, and I want to comment precisely on this topic. Uh, I agree with you in the sense that we need to do more research in order to be able to take educated, um, you know, actions based on, like, for geoengineering. Um, but I wonder to what degree, too, you say, you know, we, we separate ourselves as researchers uh, from prescribing a given decision based on, um, on, the, on the work that we do. But I wonder, do we really separate ourselves uh, as, as researchers? Do, do, our uh, do our beliefs or opinions not inform in certain ways uh, the, the projects that we pursue? Or if it's not ourselves as researchers, the funding agencies? And the example I'm thinking of is nuclear fission research that, you know, while there was also a line of uh, research that could have been pursued through the reactions of thorium, we pursued uranium because it was also beneficial for nuclear weapons. So that's an example, I think, of how, you know, general uh, beliefs of how um, 
you know, research should be uh, pursued was influenced by, you know, already prescribed notions, uh, if that makes any sense. For, I mean, for sure. We're all humans. We all bring opinions and biases, and we all are also, you know, for scientists, we're also voters. So there's no question. I mean, be unequivocal. I, I would vote for a high carbon tax. I would vote for real restrictions on CO2 emissions. Very happy. No, no question. So I have opinions. Um, but I think what I, I am questioning is the sense that may not be fair that some of the atmospheric science and science policy in the community has effectively said that because of the concerns about the so-called moral hazard, the sense that people will not react correctly to this information about solar geoengineering, that we shouldn't know more. That's, I think, a different thing and, and I think worries them because it's not their job to make that decision. Alan Robach. Hi, uh, my name is Alan Roebuck. I'm from Rutgers. Uh, I do do geoengineering research and I have grants from the National Science Foundation to do it. So it is possible to get funding yeah, we had it through the normal channels. One of the things we do is this geoengineering model under comparison project where many climate modeling groups around the world have volunteered to do climate model simulations. GFDL hasn't yet, but uh, most of the others have, and so that's money going to geoengineering research that people are contributing through the funds that they have. But there hasn't been a national research program. I think part of the answer is that Seth Borenstein is part of the answer, because he uh, interviewed John Holdren, the president's yeah. science advisor, when he first took office and said, what do you think about climate change? And through this long interview, uh, John Holdren said, well, what do you think about geoengineering? He said, well, we've got to look at everything. And Seth Borenstein wrote the article as if the president's science advisor is in favor of geoengineering rather than in favor of geoengineering research. And it sort of became radioactive. They didn't want to make it look like they'd given up on mitigation. I think that may be part of the answer. Yep. Uh, this National Academy report a year ago did recommend research. And I haven't seen a national program yet, but I think part of the problem also is where's the money going to come from? Is it going to just be reorganizing existing money? Is there going to actually be any new money? But it's intimately part of climate modeling research, and so it's going on. If you want to actually do outdoor experiments, that's going to cost a lot more than running another computer model. So that's a, uh, a bigger chunk of money. I know people that have tried to get money to do some outdoor experiments and haven't been successful yet. At the AGU meeting, uh, Ed Dunley, who was the staffer for this National Academy report, I asked him, so where's the research program that was recommended? He said, stay tuned. So maybe there is something going on. I asked my NSF program manager yesterday, do you know anything about a national research program? He said, it's above my pay grade. I, I don't know. But I said, maybe if the National Global Change Research Program is with the different agencies is planning something, I don't know. Anyway, that, that's my two cents. Okay. Is there another question? Otherwise, let's thank our speaker for a wonderful talk.